I'm really happy today because we went out for Thai for dinner last night and we had tons of leftovers and today I'm home alone and all of those leftovers are mine. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yana. I'm a modern Ajima. I read a lot in May. A lot of very highly praised, highly lauded books. It just happened to be one of those months. And so yeah, because I'm home alone today, I have the time, the energy, the wherewithal to record this video of everything that I read in May. Cheers. <laughs> I'm trying really hard not to forget any books. I wrote them all down on a post-it so I can tick off one by one. And it looks like I read a lot of stand-up comedians' memoirs. Once again, let's start off with Bossy Pants by Tina Fey. I believe I got this from my library store, but I predominantly read this via library audiobook read by the author which in these cases I feel like it's the only way to go. Yeah I, I don't know why I've been dancing around this book for so long. I'm a huge 30 Rock fan, SNL fan. This cover is a choice <laughs> and her SNL era was my my SNL wake up era. It's like Bill Hader and, and Kristen Wiig who is probably my all-time favorite SNL cast member. So much insight to, I mean, had I had I read this when it came out, as I should have done, as I wanted to, I would have known that Donald Glover uh, was a much cooler IRL version of Twofer, maybe like a Twofer slash Kenneth combo from 30 Rock. He was like the writer's room's Harvard grad coming from a large Georgia family background with uh, all of his southern sayings that the SNL writers, mostly guys, what am I saying? All guys, obviously, really did collect their piss in jars like Frank did in one episode. I think the best part was when she spoke of what it was like to juggle work, like working on 30 Rock with getting Oprah, like her white whale, to guest star in one of the episodes as a walk-on while planning her child's birthday party and juggling like that motherhood area of life. And all the while, this like once in a once in a lifetime meteor that was Sarah Palin, who looks exactly like her, was coming into our collective existence and th that was <laughs> that was a funky year in this woman's life. I've heard it revealed in this memoir that she herself was a mean girl, is a mean girl, but reading this I really appreciated its full context. She was extremely cowardly and very awkward and very privileged. It's unsurprising, it all makes sense, the math maths. It was overall just thoroughly enjoyable listening to her voice via audiobook. The physical book has color photos. It's it's just really refreshing to, I guess, reading this for the first time in 2024 of stuff that I very clearly recall from the past 10-15 years, but in like her semi-serious, like you know, she's not playing the comedian writing her memoir. It just felt so charming seeing the IRL inspirations behind all these characters that I've known and grown to love so well over the years. I also kept thinking of a line that I'm pretty sure is from the Lucy Barton books by Elizabeth Strout. Like in regards to making art and just paraphrasing it, it's you only have one story to tell and you will tell that story over and over. I feel like Tina Fey's Bossy Pants is a very good example of that line from fiction, applying it to real life. Yeah, I enjoyed this a lot. I highly recommend the audio. If you can get your hands on a physical copy, it would be nice to look through for the photos. I read A Very Punchable Face by Colin Jost via library audiobook read by the author. This was so boring! <laughs> I don't know if I'm comparing his book with Tina Fey's book. In that case, it is no contest, but it is just boring. He is acknowledging his boring life, um, his very unremarkable self. This memoir is giving nothing. <laughs> like... Why is this memoir made 
predominantly of awkward drug stories uh, and pooping his pants stories. <laughs> he could have he could have written about anything, and he chose those stories. And and he's just incredibly petty. <laughs> he acknowledges he looks like a Karen and proceeds to show his Karen behavior. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> there were like glimmers, glimmers of interesting bits re Harvard life and SNL life, but with like so much more flotsam. He mentions like multiple photo references in the physical book, which I did not even feel compelled in any way to look up <laughs> I had zero motivation to yeah I I gave this I gave this a one star I think on Goodreads I read Born Standing Up A Comic's Life by Steve Martin this came out in 2007 I read it as a library audiobook read by the author first of all great cover his iconic white suit I do recommend reading this via audiobook because he reads his own book and there's also him playing his banjo for her musical accompaniment throughout. But um, I think I've said this before, but I don't find any of the pre-90s, even even like early 90s comedians, very funny at all. I, and especially Steve Martin. I love Steve Martin as an actor, as a writer, as a fictional writer. Mm, he's fine as a writer <laughs> overall, but I don't find his comedy particularly enthralling. And I think it's because I don't really find him as a person that enthralling. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm still like wrestling with that in my mind. Like, how am I a fan of his work if I'm not a fan of him as a person? But in the audiobook, he reads it very stiffly, very woodenly, but it's intentional. That's like his brand of humor. But I just personally found it quite hard to get through. And the writing is also quite wooden as well. It's very old school, almost as if he sees himself as like a 1950s John Steinbeck type of writer. And he kind of gives the sense of his writing being his main profession and all else is secondary, which is, you know, fine. Like I recall Shop Girl having that touch of remove, but I felt at the time, at least, I am due for a reread of that book. I have fond memories of that book. I felt like that stiffness kind of worked in fiction, but it just comes across as dull in nonfiction. Yeah, I know that he's just famous for his dry wit, to say the least, and this is full of it. It's just always gone over my head and I just don't lol. It's also perhaps a generational thing. I really feel like he just speaks as if he's coming from a different era. He also mentions a lot of people from the previous century. So for me, it was purely at best a man's account growing up in the mid 20th century Southern California making his way in the entertainment industry as opposed to like a gossipy memoir full of name drops and stories like I wanted that I also just didn't find very interesting. Comedy is a distortion of what is happening and there will always be something happening. Yeah, I, I think that he's plenty smart, that he's totally charming. <sighs> I read The Secret History of Wonder Woman by Jill Lepore. I own a physical copy, which, which has lots of visuals, but I predominantly read this via library audiobook read by the author. I was incredibly intrigued by the 2017 film Professor Marston and the Wonder Women, directed by Angela Robinson. It stars Luke Evans, Rebecca Hall, Oh, and I'm blanking on the third the third person. But yeah, I found that movie like very interesting. I didn't think it was great, but it was I felt like it was something that I just didn't really see too often on screen. And I wanted to know more about the IRL people. Saw that this book is what it was more or less based off of. And oh boy, did I get the full story in all its messy glory. Glory? Hmm. The book goes much more in depth into Marston's career and all its sketchiness, a lot of complicated elements, um, showing why these people made their choices because they're 
complex human beings, <laughs> to say the least. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> if, if you can't tell, the book as well as the film both perplexed me. <laughs> Because again, it's talk it's telling a story that's just not often told. It involves polygamy, it involves feminist history, life in academia, Hollywood, the progressive thinkers of this time of the early to mid 20th century. I don't know why I'm like trying not to give spoilers for this nonfiction but like extremely riveting book. I, I do recommend this. I did like this a lot. If you are unaware, Professor, oh, what's his name? He had a great name. I think I wrote it in my Goodreads review, which I'm trying to update. I, I was so diligent about writing like pretty lengthy, wordy Goodreads re reviews for a couple years. And then like last year or this year, I just totally lost that momentum. And I'm trying to make sure that every single book that I have rated has some words on it. <laughs> However pithy <laughs> at this point, I'm anything counts. I'll take anything. <laughs> but it's a story. Oh my God. It's a story about, uh, Professor James Marston, who invented the lying machine, is that what it was called? I know that it's not the polygraph, is that what it's called? I think he invented like the lie detector tester. <sighs> yeah, they're different. <laughs> and how his personal life, his personality, the people who were around him, who were all pro very progressive feminist thinkers, all quite randomly, in my opinion, inspired him to create the character that we now know as Wonder Woman. And I guess what I liked so much about this book, what, what felt so compelling to me is seeing how in the early to mid 1900s, these very progressive feminists, there were women who were having the same struggles that we do now, <laughs> like for work-life balance, the having it all notion and now that i know like the true story of what these real people were like and what they really did uh very much not um accurate to that hollywood depiction of the movie that so intrigued me at first but like still what i truly enjoyed from that movie was that yearning element of wanting to be with the one you, of the one person that you truly want to be with and the IRL people were truly inspiring to have lived the way that they truly wanted to and thinking any other way of living would just be silly and wouldn't work for them at all. We're talking, you know, things that are still very taboo for a lot of people in the major the vast majority parts of the world, much less a <laughs> hundred years ago. And it is really impressive how uh, Lepore, the writer, goes through this like incredibly dense information. There's just so much stuff to wade through, but she does it so well <laughs> in such like she organizes the book in such a way that like it's very it's very it's a very complicated mess that you're wading through. Nevertheless, you're still like seeing everything. You're still getting everything, and the audiobook is done very well, and the physical book is also very <laughs> well worth looking through. <laughs> There's also color reproductions in the middle of the book with the original comic artwork. And I believe the last 100 pages are all notes and references. Jill Lepore is incredibly thorough. Yeah, I highly recommend. <laughs> I know I did a poop job talking about this book, but I... <laughs> I think it just shows how unsimple it is, how random it is. <laughs> this is definitely worth a uh, read. I highly recommend. I read Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. I also own this book, but I mostly read it via library audio, which was read by the author. Basically, every time I've been such an audiobook whore this year, especially if I see that it's read by the author, especially if I see that it's read by a celebrity voice. Even if I have the physical copy, I feel like at this point that's just gonna be a bonus. Something to flip through if it's a little bit more intense, a little more dense, then I will do like the simultaneous, um, like all, <laughs> all senses combined reading experience. But this was, does not warrant that. This felt like, 
uh, an IRL Carrie Bradshaw, but if we thought Carrie Bradshaw was bad in her 30s, like self-absorbed as she is, this is a real person in her tweet in her teens and 20s who was absolutely heinous and alas, absolutely relatable for the basic bees such as myself. <laughs> she is the poster child of privilege. I heard lots of hate for this book. I guess, I guess this book is uh, quite divisive from what I've heard. If you love it, you love it. Uh, I can imagine if you love it, you also love Sex and the City, but unironically, I, I suppose. <laughs> If you hate it, you're more or less saying, like, you're a jerk, you're an asshole. <laughs> like, this person is an asshole. However, and, and I'm, I guess I'm agreeing with both of those opinions. <laughs> However, I do, I can't help feeling that this is very similar to Emily Rajkowski's My Body. There being, like, how should women be? Like, that's the question that both of those books are asking. I feel like Alderton is very self-aware. <laughs> what a shit show she was. Uh, adhering to such male gay standards, uh, she felt like shit while telling herself she is the shit. Like that's the uh, that's what she was going through. And I can't help but to feel that the haters are just flexing their virtue, like their cool girlness. <laughs> like good for you that you. <laughs> you know, weren't listening to pop and you were all in like a punk indie phase. <laughs> like good for you that you eschewed sample sales. Having said that, uh, the writing is extremely regurgitated. <laughs> it's, it's just not good. I didn't think that the writing was good at all. Um, good enough for even this basic of a person's life story. Like what were all the recipes for? Is that just like a trend of when this book came out, which was 2018? No way. <laughs> Ugh, the text exchanges were just awful. I don't know. It was just kind of giving a Taylor Jenkins Reid, is that her name? TJR vibe. <laughs> Spo so spoiler alert. I know I'm talking about what I read in May, but in, uh, I think it was this month. Yes. In July, I read good materials, which I fucking loved. So <laughs> I wrote in my notes, oh, I have ghosts on my shelves. I'm apprehensive to read it. Should I? I'm, I'm gonna read ghosts. <laughs> so I, mm, I don't know. This was, this was complicated. <laughs> like this, the, the content of this book is extremely uncomplicated. My feelings for this book it's complicated. <laughs> I read Pandora's Jar by Natalie Haynes. I am blowing through my Natalie Haynes books this year. I own a physical copy. I I just prefer to read Natalie Haynes via audiobook read by herself. She has an incredible voice. At this point, it's just unthinkable to consume her in any other way. I believe this is her like first big breakout book. FYI, my first Natalie Haynes I read this year, I want to say back in February, and it was Divine Might, which was like her new release book. And that goes in depth of the Greek goddesses who are incredibly popular uh, and very well known, but it's like a, you think you know, but you don't know them. And Pandora's Jar came out in 2020, and this goes into the stories of like lesser known women in Greek myth. Both books, well, all of her books have a very dominantly feminist lens of viewing these Greek myths and just blasting our preconceived notions, our misconceptions. Like Pandora, was she malevolently opening her jar to bring man's downfall? Or was the fucking jar even hers to begin with? <laughs> Like, was it a setup? Jocasta? Who was she? Why do I only know Oedipus's name, even though we all know that he had a thing for mom? How milfs be threatening? <laughs> I just love Natalie Haynes' indignant humor. Jason so much enjoys being magnanimous to Medea in her apparent acceptance of her defeat that it costs me actual physical energy not to reach into the pages or onto the stage and slap him.
Uh, even Helen of Troy, we think we know her, but we don't. Helen of Troy, Helen of Sparta, Helen of Joy, Helen of Slaughter. I enjoyed every single Natalie Haynes I've consumed thus far. Having said that, this might be, and I enjoyed the crap out of this, this might be like at the bottom of my list. I mean, they're all going to be like <laughs> S tier level, but um, yeah, for some reason, this one it's just a little um, it's just a little forgettable and it's about the more forgettable women of greek myths so maybe that's not my fault <laughs> but yes love natalie haynes loved reading this book i finally read stoner by john williams i held off on this book for so long much trepidation reading this and immediately upon reading it i immediately realized why like I knew that there's gonna be no hiding here. I knew that I would only find hard truths in this book. This is grown up shit. This is unavoidable work, sacrifice, tough choices. The only dislike I have, and I, I'm seeing a lot of people saying the same thing, but I didn't really care for the fact that Edith is like so one dimensionally evil. But even that, I can't fault the story for because. She's really supposed to represent the like unchangeable, irrefutable hardship that one just has no control over sometimes in their lives. It's just a part of the life cards that you're dealt. I snot nose cried steadily for like the, the final 30% of the book <laughs> because of just the absolute waste of potential. And then I started crying harder <laughs> At the entirety of his daughter's like entire future how like she ended up her confession she made to her father on like why she made all of her choices and that is when it's driven home how life truly goes by so quickly and like this is why you see all of the articles all the memes of the importance of <laughs> being picky <laughs> about the people of the people that you choose to be around you and how that is a direct correlation to the quality of your life with like the quality of people that you choose to be around. I've been seeing some people talking about this book of, that it's about how his life was wasted, that like he's a sad sack and I don't think that at all. Despite its excruciatingly sad imperfections, I still found this to be a story of incremental success like i can only imagine the life that his grandson will have will go on to lead with his particular generational inheritance who he will meet and then influence and that whole notion is why one of my favorite shows on the earth is mad men which to this day <laughs> i think about on the daily about its message of generational inheritance like you may think that your mom is crazy but she is sally <laughs> And she was raised by her incredibly beautiful but abusive mom and an enigmatic absent dad who was too busy philandering to ever really be in your in her life and to get to know her. And that's why your mom isn't doing that for you or she's trying to, but it's not coming across very well. Like that show is not about the advertising industry. <laughs> it's about why your parents are such shits. And... <laughs> I knew this book would give me that dull, slow burn kind of pain, and it did. And I knew I would love it. <laughs> and I'm just really pleased that it lives up to the hype. I am eager for more. I have Butcher's Crossing. I have the third one. I have Augustus, which I'm hearing are even better than Stoner. <laughs> Yes, I'm eager for more, but I need to heal for I need to heal first. I'm I'm very grateful that my John Williams cherry has been popped by Stoner. <laughs> and I'm not gonna tell you to go run out and read this. Like read this when you're ready. <sighs> I read Howard's End by E.M. Forster. Uh <laughs> I'm I'm so wowed. I knew that. I knew the vague story. I saw the 90s Merchant Ivory film um, and immediately after reading this, I watched the more recent, when did it come out? Like the more recent uh, BBC Masterpiece miniseries, which was incredibly book faithful. I highly recommend both. So I knew the story already going into it. 
but somehow the book still holds so much delight, so much surprise. I really feel like Forster was so ahead of his time. Like, like the abolitionists of the 19th century, but for capitalism in the early 20th century. I think two years ago, I read my first E.M. Forster, which was A Room with a View, which I absolutely loved. It is, it is egregious that it took me two years to read another Forster. But it's so lovely to be back in, in the, his, like bygone yet very relatable like real world of Forster's writing. Helen is so vibrant. She feels so real despite her very uh, manic pixie dream girl energy. Like how does he make tropes feel so real? He just makes these like very uh, early 1900s stories feel so contemporary and just I'm sorry for all of you Middlemarch lovers but this is what I wanted Middlemarch to be. I wanted Dorothea to be more like Margaret. I wanted the money talk to be more like the money talk in Howard's End. I loved the examination of wealth and class disparity. It like kind of actually reminded me of the film Parasite how like in Forrester's way though, not in Pong joon way. And you're shown with a shock all of the layers to privilege and power and what that looks like in a real life basis. And the house is an ingenious tool to tell the story, to show wealth, to show power. I love stories about houses. It just tells so much about people, about society, about how they all run. This was dramatic. <laughs> it was like, <gasps> like every twist and turn. Um, this was very contemplative. This was shockingly good. I don't like to mark on my books much anymore, but for Howard's End, unless I know that it's gonna be a book that I really wanna keep, but for Howard's End, I just could not help myself. I I had to mark this up. I had to mark this up. <laughs> I read The Phoenix Bride by Natasha Siegel as a library ebook. First of all, Look at this cover. It is the most beautiful cover I've ever seen. And yeah, I just wanted a change of pace with like a lightweight romance, a sweet airy dessert. Um, this has another manic pixie dream girl, a uh, heroine <laughs> who like has to keep telling the gentle, earnest, literal nursing doctor man that they love each other and that they belong together but the powers that be force them apart and it's all very hot complete with like a rainy climax and this like confection of a historical romance. I found this enjoyable. It didn't like fully capture my heart, but I, it's like, it's just exactly what I wanted at the moment. And sometimes you just need, you just need that every now and then. Those books also have their place in the sun. I, I don't know. I just found this like very nice, <laughs> like very direct. Uh, I want you, you want me, let's bang <laughs> type of vibes which frankly we need more of in this world yeah this was fun this was this was cotton candy but like when you are at a fair on a hot sunny day it's exactly what you want when you're in that situation <laughs> i read charming young man by elliot schrafer as a library as a library book uh, both actually Charming Young Man and The Phoenix Bride I read because of recommendations from Matthew Schur. <laughs> oh my god, what was that? By Matthew Schur Appa. <laughs> this is so cute. A, a soup full of feelings indeed. It's, it's that feeling when you're young, you're full of potential. A lot of amazing things are happening, like meeting incredible people who are going to make your life so wonderful. But also there's m so much vulnerability. There's a lot of insecurity. Just constantly not knowing what the right thing to say or do. This was very earnest and horny and comfortable. <laughs> this is also corny, but in like a cute, funny way. Mom had me take out my cufflinks because they made me look like a dandy. Is this 1890 or 1870? I swear. <laughs> but like it's historical fiction with fictionalized uh, historic people. IRL people like Marcel Proust and John Singer Sargent and like the cream of the crop of Victorian society of their day. Uh, and this is so, so, so gay and with like a very healthy fear and discomfort of hometown homophobia, the feeling of not being accepted, 
feeling uncomfortable in both the familiar and the new. This was fun. This is young. This is direct. That's eager. It's got a glorious epilogue with a note from the author about how this book came to be. Oh, this was so tender. This was really fun. This is really good. This right here is the party I was waiting all day for. I read Gone Girl by Jillian Flynn. Uh, I own the book, but I mostly read this via library audio, which was read by Julia Whelan and Kirby Hayborn, who read the Amy and Nick parts. I guess the initial reaction and the easiest thing to say is that they're both toxic people who should get a divorce. I like vaguely recall the girl power sentiments from like the now infamous monologue from the film, but in like the current context of therapy speak, I just found it rendered moot. Like I was just so frustrated by um, mostly the Amy character, although really both, like just directly communicate each other instead of in riddles. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, just tell him, stop cheating on me instead of arranging these elaborate, intricate scavenger hunts. You are not meant for each other. And like, I guess while I was reading it, it felt unnecessarily plotty and like extraordinary, like in the sense of it's being extra. <laughs> But then after I finished it, like, I, it, it kept lingering. It got under my skin. And this is when I, you know, I don't know, I don't even remember what I rated it on Goodreads. Like, I think I was, while reading it, at like a two to three. But then it, it lingered and I kept thinking about it. And I realized, like, this is actually a very common story, uh, despite all the extra. It's about women who spin their wheels for men who don't reciprocate. Like, tell me you don't know anybody like that. I won't believe you. And the subtext of the 2010s recession that I don't really recall from the film, but like, it, was, it felt like another point against it where these are privileged white people problems that are supposed to encourage sympathy. I feel like the writer was trying to encourage sympathy, but uh, absolutely not. <laughs> Am I supposed to feel sad that these rich people lost their money and now they have to move to the Midwest? <laughs> because apparently that is unthinkable. No, GTFO. But that like riches to rags element and the and her parents subplots, the those elements of the book, though I think those were the ones that kept lingering the most and ended up feeling the more the most compelling. Like her her parents' experiment of raising the perfect child. The idea that children are ultimately products of their parents' unintended mistakes. I guess I'm trying to say that I feel like it's the message imparted from this book is is good, but the method telling it <laughs> feels very like chaotic and a little extra, kind of messy. Uh, but yeah, like it's a unique plot with interesting and unlikable characters. The fact is, my wife is a murderess who is sometimes really fun. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm still kind of conflicted by this. Um, if you've read this, please let me know in the comments what you think about this. Like overall, again, I don't remember what I put on my Goodreads ratings. I want to say a three or four. I'm still, I'm still hovering there. I don't know. It's. I don't think this is a book to like completely write off. Maybe I'm I'm maybe I missed the point entirely. I definitely need a like a book club for this. Fun fact, I actually am in a book club and we did read this, but none of those other bitches actually fucking read the book. And I'm the only one, so you gotta help me out. <laughs> help me. <laughs> help me, let's talk. <laughs> I read James by Percival Everett. <laughs> Another buzzy uh, new release book um, that I also am <laughs> coming to you once more for help with. <laughs> So I, so I like bought this book because of like everybody's glowing reviews and high praise for it. This is my first Percival Everett. I did not know who Percival Everett was until reading this. I want to say around the 25 percentile mark. This kept making me think of the movie American Fiction, like the tone of it. And I was like, what is happening? So I looked it up and lo and behold, Percival Everett wrote Erasure, which is the book that American Fiction is based on. So <laughs> this is why <laughs> that kind of shit is just important. And then, and then I continued to watch American Fiction like while I was reading James. And because of that, my brain like has 
links those these two together for better or for worse and it's not necessarily a problem that I have with James probably more for American fiction which is unfair because that's like a movie made by somebody else but based off of Everett's work however I, I feel like both James and American fiction thinks it's being subversive and it is but to me it, they just come across as cynical. I know that James is a retelling of the original Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain and as you know I've been all about the retellings this year so I, that was another reason why I felt compelled to read James and experience like this particular kind of retelling. Elements like the villains in James felt so like comical. I felt like it kind of took away from the genuine. And it's not to say that I disagree or don't appreciate the overall message of racism being awful. And I think the double meaning concept of language is a great way of showing of showing like another intricate layer of how racism pervades. I guess I suppose I guess I like the concept, just maybe not what he did with it. And I also just cannot um, not think about this blurb, Percival Everett is a genre. Like that in itself, I feel like is a double meaning. It is reading, reading James, I feel like I've read an entire type of, an entire genre. And I feel like if I were to read any of his other books, they would feel the same way, just have like different plot, different characters, but overall be the same sort of thing. And I suppose I'm just not a Percival Everett fan to continue further. But yeah, I I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm perplexed. I'm wondering if this just, if I just didn't get it. If, like I'm mostly seeing people reading James and going, whoa, I never thought of that before. Or like how ingenious that the black people of the 1800s, they were intelligent human beings. Like, yeah, and it is a good choice that he uses a book like, that Everett uses a book like Huckleberry Finn to tell this particular story as like a gateway into the nature of racism during this time. I'm also seeing a lot of people say that this book is funny. I, I didn't get that at all. Like Ann Patchett said that James is funny and I love Ann Patchett and I usually agree with what she says. Yeah, I don't know, another conflicted quandary. I do have to say, if you have James on your radar, but you've never read Huck Finn, do not worry. If that is you, you can just read this blind and just feel all the twists and turns raw and go, whoa, that's a crazy story. <laughs> if you have read Huck Finn, but it's been a while, like we're talking decades, that's my case. All of the elements will feel very familiar as they happen and you will kind of see the turns coming and once they do you'll like remember them or at least it'll feel familiar and you'll still understand it. And then if you are very familiar with Huck Finn, I don't know, who are you? <laughs> Who's reading Mark Twain in 2024? <laughs> so um, I can only recommend you read James because it is a it, it is actually a pretty fast read. I could have finished this in one sitting. It's but I think I finished it in like two, maybe three. And it's only because I was just groaning at, you know, like with my feelings about this. So yes, if you have read James, please let me know. Like if you hear what I'm saying and you're like, oh Yana, stop. Like this is what you missed, or you know, like this it was going for this, or I, I don't know. Like please, please let me know help. <laughs> Last but not least, <laughs> I read Perfume and Pain by Anne Adorn. Uh, another buzzy, <laughs> like, new release. I don't know, is Anne Adorn buzzy? Yeah, I pre-ordered this bitch because I read Exalted last year. It was so fun, so good. I was extremely compelled by Anna Dorn's writing that when I saw that she's writing a book about perfume and um, Hollywood, LA life and and like lesbian fun, I was like, add to cart. <laughs> oh, I love the worlds of Anna Dorn. I find them so fun, so re not relatable, more like they feel, they feel relatable. Like they feel like it's it, it real. <laughs> and this feels like it was written fucking yesterday with um like very firmly in 
our world of like social commentary, bookstagram, the she's not doing okay at all, Goodreads, <laughs> Goodreads subgenre, uh, Libby audiobooks, spiraling through the Fragrantica website and ordering online samples of indie perfumes. I know this world. I'm in this world. <laughs> and this is so very LA. Uh, just knowing that if you open the window when you live by the freeway and everything gets coated in gray exhaust, just astrology, fragrance, Helga Pataki from Hey Arnold references, feeling old but wanting to be young but just feeling old. <laughs> this is funny. It's also sad, but in like a pathetic way. All her books are just like heightened manic fun. And I defy you to not find one character that doesn't remind you of somebody that you know IRL. For me, it was the Cat Gold character, the person who I'm sure means well, but also like legit no one who means that well <laughs> is also that ruthless and fake. Very fun. So that was some of the books that I read in the month of May. <laughs> I think I'm going to pause on the stand-up comedian memoirs for sure. I am currently out of, after June, I am currently out of more Natalie Haynes. I'm very sad about that. I am, as I said in the beginning of the video, home alone. So I will be <laughs> making my June wrap-up video and just keep going until my family comes home. <laughs> but... <sighs> This was such a like explosive month of reading. Reading all these books that I've wanted to read for a long time, like Stoner and Howard's End. Reading a lot of like buzzy contemporary books that a lot of people love, but I'm like, really this? <laughs> so yeah, it, I guess this is why we do this. Why we talk about books on the YouTube and we're like putting it out into the ether like help me <laughs> did you read this too what did you think about it like what do you think about the Dolly Alderton the Jillian Flynn the Percival Everett what <laughs> help me <laughs> like in the comments below I want just full discussion on those three writers please <laughs> so with that I will see you very soon for June wrap up, the mid year video, um, like July wrap up. Oof, I have a lot of work to do before I go on my vacation in August. So please start commenting down below as I am editing this bitch, and I will see you soon. Thank you for watching. Bye.